Today I want to share a really special painting with you. Today's painting is of a precious Yorkie named Kearney who has passed over the Rainbow Bridge. These are always really special projects for me. It's a chance to really hear a pet's story and do something really special for their owners that can be a big comfort to them when they most need it. Sometimes these are even gifted from friends, which I especially love because it's a way for me to give back to even more people and hear not only about how special an animal was to their people, but also to hear about friendships and the way in which we will do so much to support and care for one another. I think it's one of the most amazing things that art can do, and I just feel really privileged to be a part of that. I loved painting this piece of Kearney. I love her expression and how much personality was clear from the photo that I'm painting from. I also just had a great time painting her, which I'll talk about more on a technical level later in the video. One challenge, though, of paintings like this one is that I can't take the photo that I'm painting from, and this is largely what I'd like to talk about today. In doing so, whether you're an artist or whether you're looking to have an artist depict um, a pet that you no longer have close to you, um, I hope this is a tremendous help, and I hope you just get to really enjoy watching this painting unfold. As I've talked about in previous videos that I'm going to link in the upper right hand corner, so much of my work comes down to taking a fantastic reference and having as much control as possible over the process of creating the piece from start to finish. That also means that I'm able to give my client a lot of control. Um, and we're able to communicate these ideas and collaborate on a composition to make sure that we make the most amazing painting together that we possibly can. But without my being able to take a photo, these types of portraits require a completely different approach. Thankfully, though, for this painting of Kearney, I had really fantastic luck, and I'm going to explain why and how you can hopefully replicate that in your own painting, whether it's something you're making yourself or a piece that you're commissioning. So I want to talk a little bit about what the process of working with a client for this kind of project looks like, because it's a little bit different than a typical project for me. With all of my projects, I really like to begin by hearing the story that's behind the piece. Um, for some pets, that means actually getting to go meet them and play with them and get to know their personality. Or if I'm creating a portrait of a person, it's hearing what their interests are and what their character is like. Now, this sort of project for a commemorative portrait is no exception. From there, though, rather than trying to plan a photo shoot, the next step in the process is having the client send me the photo reference that I'm ultimately going to work from. Now, this process is definitely a back and forth. So I start by asking my client for all of their favorite photos of their pet that we're going to be choosing from. When in doubt, more is better, but I find that out of a handful of favorites, there's usually a clear winner. And I've definitely noticed trends in these pieces, so I wanted to share with you all what these trends are and how you can use this to make sure that you have the best photos possible for a project like this. So here are the shots that almost always do well and why these are statistically much easier to get with pet portraits. 
My hope is that by sharing these trends, you'll have more outstanding references to work with in general, regardless of the subject. It may be true that these are shots that you're more likely to get when taking photos of pets, but they absolutely apply to just about any other subject as well. The first trend that means that I usually get really good photos of pets to work with is that people love taking photos of their pets outside, which usually means great lighting and great color. I haven't talked about this much on my channel, if at all, but the source of your light makes a really big difference not only on the temperature of the light hitting the subject and thus the overall mood, but also the number of other colors that are going to reflect and bounce off of that. Now, I'm not a physicist, so I won't try and explain this, but my understanding is that full spectrum light, like we get outside, reflects the most colors, while as soon as you try to reproduce natural light artificially indoors, that effect is weakened. Now, if anyone would like to like actually explain this um, with more fluency than me um, or more detail than me, I hope you'll chime in in the comments because I'm sure one of you can help all of us understand this even more clearly. But until then, I hope that you will just trust me. Um, taking pictures in natural sunlight results in much more vivid and colorful images, whereas when you take photos inside, the colors tend to feel just a little bit more stale. And naturally, as a painter who really loves focusing on natural light and color, um, this is near and dear to my heart. But that's not the only thing that makes for a great photo. So the second trend that I've noticed is that photos of animals are often taken at a little bit more of a distance because unlike people, animals aren't really inclined to run up to a camera for their close-up. That means that more often than not, the whole pet is in the shot. And this helps give me as the artist more options as far as cropping and composition. And it also helps avoid lens distortion that can occur especially in camera phones, when a subject is super close to the lens. As a side note, if you kind of want an example of what I mean, there are like these whole articles on the internet about how people are getting more nose jobs now because they take selfies with camera phones and selfies with camera phones make your nose look bigger than they actually are. Um, so if you want evidence of lens distortion and you can't necessarily see it, um, this is how that is playing out. And of course, this is the last thing we want regardless of the type of portrait that we're painting. We want something that feels lifelike and that captures the subject with as much realism and authenticity as we can bring to it. This is also just closer to what you would see in a classical painting, where it's really rare to crop in on a subject the way we do in modern photography. Now, there's nothing wrong with capturing this in a painting, um, but it's just not the style of painting that I'm interested in. As someone commented in a recent video, I'm trying to paint the subject, not paint the photo. And this brings me to trend number three, which is that pets hold pretty neutral expressions most of the time. Unlike people, they don't make um, bizarre faces for the camera, um, and they don't emote as obviously as people do either. Or at least, it's not as obvious to us. When painting people from photos, this can be a real problem because the traditional look of a high-end oil painting is one where the subject actually sat for the painting, which meant that they couldn't hold weird facial expressions or poses or even a smile. And animals don't really have this problem of trying to smile for a camera, and we similarly don't try and capture moments where they're making intense expressions to nearly the extent we do with people. For instance, when painting children, a lot of the time we opt for photos of them laughing to use as reference, but 
this never really would have been a thing we would capture in a painting. So it really almost is better suited to photography as opposed to a reproduction in oil. The result is that oftentimes photos of animals just look more natural and easygoing as if they were really posing for the portrait that we're painting. And then for trend number four, along the same lines, the best photos we take of animals on our phones or actual cameras, if we like have them handy for some reason, <laughs> um, as consumers, are not usually action shots. We try and wait for our pets to be still because that's what our cameras are good at capturing. And this achieves the same kind of stillness and easy expression um, as I was pointing out in the previous trend. So if you're taking photos of your pet now thinking that you may want a painting of them one day, well, if that's the case, you should ask me to come take photos of them. <laughs> um, then again, I can't fly to all corners of the globe. So um, if you are taking or setting aside photos for an artist rendering of your pet, here's what I would look for. One is that a shot that's high resolution and in focus as best as possible. Two is a shot that is in good outdoor lighting that has vibrant color. Three is a pose that is fairly still or calm with the focus most likely on their face. And four is maybe most important, which is an image that is just the most special to you. After all, the most important part of a portrait like this is to capture and honor your loved one's personality. And your favorite photos probably do that best. Even if an artist can't go solely off of this image, perhaps it can inform the ultimate painting in some way. And before I go on, I want to point out that all of these things, as I mentioned before, also apply even if you aren't taking photos of your pets. Let's say you want to take a really fantastic photo of your child or grandchild or someone that's really special to you. Going outside into a beautifully lit day and taking a still poised portrait that is in focus, has high resolution and captures them in a moment of calm that still allows their personality to come through, there's a really good chance that that would make for a beautiful painting. I've actually thought about doing an entire demo on taking photos for a portrait if the artist you're working with can't take them for you, which is especially relevant right now while we are social isolating. Um, if you'd be interested in a video like that, please give this video a like and tell me down below in the comments. Um, it's a totally different video than I normally film, um, and that's why I really want to hear if this is something you all would be interested in. But now I want to get back to beautiful Kearney. What I loved about the reference for this painting um, was that it was, it was high res. Her expression and pose were fantastic um, and they spoke to her personality. That and it was just a special image. This one was shot indoors, so I had to use my imagination a bit to brighten up the colors and make it feel a little bit brighter than it did originally. But this just goes to show that you don't have to have everything perfect in order to make a beautiful painting. But the more of these factors that you can bring in when selecting a piece, the more options and the more possibilities you're going to have to create something that is really beautiful and really special. As I mentioned in my video of Millie that I'll link above, these paintings that I've been working on recently all gave me these little breakthroughs in my own process. With Millie, I had a fantastic block in that gave me a huge head start on the rest of the painting. I found that this was true with Kearney too. I love the way that the transparency of her block in worked with her coat and the texture of her silky fur to give the piece a sense of shine. This meant that I didn't have to 
overwork or rework sections. I could let my block in do a lot of the work for me. But it wasn't the only breakthrough I had in this painting, actually. I also began to really work thicker in the later layers of this painting, which felt like this tiny but critical step toward working more loosely with paint that is more wet and thus even more tricky, but that can help me get much closer to a result that looks incredibly painterly. I think the trigger here, or what about this particular painting helped me get here, was just how blended and silky the long strands of fur were around her face. It just made sense to use more paint to allow the colors to mix together. It definitely felt a little bit foreign to work this way. I almost panicked a little bit, like how am I going to control this amount of paint and keep everything clean? I don't want to push this too far. But not long after I had that feeling, I kind of relaxed into it and realized that this is just new. It doesn't mean that I can't control what's happening. Um, And more importantly, it doesn't mean that I'm not about to get a really cool result from it. And unsurprisingly, as I moved forward, what I found was that I was able to get the kind of brushwork and texture and paint buildup that I've been chasing in my work this whole time. Now, just like I discussed with the breakthrough in Millie's painting, this does not mean that I have arrived. I'm sure there will need to be many more times when paintings give me the opportunity to test myself and grow and try these little exercises before I feel like I'm working with as much impasto or with paint that is wet enough or thick enough for my liking. It will not be a one and done. But stopping to note and appreciate these little moments, I think that makes us more likely to understand why they happened so that we can open the door and take more baby steps forward like this more often and more easily in the future. And I certainly don't know how many baby steps it will take, but I'm very excited to see the process unfold. That's something that more and more I think is incredibly important to becoming the artist that you want to be whether it's someone who is just better at painting than you are now, or a professional, or someone who is regularly selling X amount of work, or someone with international acclaim, or an all-time master that we wind up talking about for years and years to come. I think if you're on that path, it's much more about that path itself. It's about the day-to-day choices rather than having this one big moment. I was just listening to Atomic Habits, which I'll link in the description if you're interested in reading more of this book. And the author shared an interesting anecdote about athletes who become either Olympians or just really good professionals. I forget what the distinction was, but in any event, that's not really the point of this story. But the idea that he shared was that what separated those athletes from the rest of us was their ability to sit with the boredom or the tedium of what it takes to become great. And I think a part of this is being willing to look at the process in these tiny baby steps more than we're looking at the finish line. So... I'm really curious. You know, for me, my baby steps have to do with loosening up and really leaning into the brushwork and letting the brush and the paint kind of control the image rather than me trying to tighten the piece up and wield my own control there. But I want to know what your goals are like. Do you have anything like that in your own work? A goal that's so important that even 
tiny victories feel like these monumental things that we need to celebrate. I'm curious what sorts of things you're working on, so let me know in the comments. As always, if you found this video helpful or you just thought Kearney was adorable, I hope that you will give this video a like so that others can find this video too. And if you'd like to see more videos like this one, please, if you haven't already, subscribe and hit the notification bell so you do not miss a thing. Until then, thank you so much for watching. I hope you and your loved ones stay safe and happy painting.